Uh, welcome, everyone, uh, to this seminar on uh, Jesus in the rubble. Um, and uh, just let me say a few things about how technically things are going to work this evening, um, <clears throat> and then we'll launch uh, into the evening itself. Um, given the large number of people and the topic that we're discussing, um, we've set the comments uh, this evening so that they can only be directed to the co-hosts. So you can only send comments to either myself or Finn, who is our tech person, uh, or to Paul Pinkowski. If you have questions and comments, especially questions that you would like to be answered or comments that you think might be helpful for the discussion, um, please send those to me, to Sylvia Keysmat, um, and then uh, I'll be moderating the Q&A later and we can uh, answer those questions or post those comments if they fit well with what, uh, uh, with the flow of the conversation. Um, we're gonna try at the end to address as many questions as we can uh, or direct you to places where you can find the answers if, if indeed there are answers to your questions. <laughs> Some questions just are, are hard. Um, and, um, we should have uh, this evening um, quite a large number of people. If there, for some reason, you cannot uh, put something into the chat um, uh, and you need to ask a question in person, then save your question till, till the end um, and hit the raise hand function and then uh, Finn will unmute you. Um, Veronica, I see you have your hand up already, so I don't know if this is, <laughs> and you've taken it down. Okay, so <laughs> uh, that's good to know it's been clear so far. Um, the way the evening will flow is that uh, Paul and I will introduce each other, there will be an opening prayer, and then I'm going to be um, speaking for about an hour. For those of you who normally take a class with me, you'll uh, recall that we often take a break at the eight o'clock mark. We're not going to do that this evening unless I am way ahead of what I have to say, uh, but probably we're just going to push on, on through. And then uh, after I have talked about the Bible for a while uh, and Israel, Palestine, then Paul will talk about initiatives for peace for a bit. And then we'll have hopefully half an hour, 25 minutes, half an hour for questions uh, at the end. So um, let's begin. I'm going to begin by um, introducing uh, Paul Pinkowski to you. So Paul Pinkowski is, is a founding member of Voices for Peace, an annual ecumenical conference on peacemaking. He is a member of Church of the Redeemer, an, an Anglican church in Toronto, where he facilitates literature and poetry discussions at their common table drop-in for those who struggle with hunger and homelessness. He is the vice president of the International Thomas Merton Society and a man of deep wisdom and humility. I'm so grateful to be doing this seminar with him. And over to you, Paul. It's been a privilege to work closely with Sylvia Keysmat over the past four months, trying to encourage in an all too quiet church, a prophetic voice for peacemaking. Sylvia holds a PhD in biblical studies from Oxford University. She taught at Trinity College at the Toronto School of Theology and served as co-chair of the Bishop's Committee on Creation Care for the Anglican Diocese of Toronto. Sylvia and her husband, Brian Walsh, are the co-authors of Romans Disarmed, Resisting Empire, Demanding Justice, perhaps the best piece of writing on Paul's letters currently available. Sylvia brings not only excellent scholarship to her inquiries, but also a sense of creativity and imagination. She crafts from the biblical stories a renewed vision of what it means to be a community of faith and how we engage with a hurting planet. More importantly, Sylvia lives out of that vision through her work with Sanctuary, a community that offers love and dignity to Toronto's homeless, and through her work practicing and teaching organic farming. And it's a pleasure to be sharing the microphone with you. Thanks, Paul. 
Um, we'll now open uh, with a short prayer litany um, together. Uh, feel free at home to say uh, the responses, which are in bold. Let us pray. Creator God, you called into being a world of wonder, a world of trees, hills, and rivers, animals large and small, and your earth creature who bears your image to enjoy and serve the creation. Yet all we see around us is violence and death. Surround us with your creative spirit. That resurrection might grow around us. Liberating God, you called into being dance and song, play and humor, so many ways to delight in your world. Yet captives surround us, the innocent in jails, children imprisoned, walls that exclude and destroy. Surround us with your spirit of freedom. That liberation might grow around us. Spirit of lament, you call us to share in the sorrow of the victims, the cries of the children under the bombs, the tears of the parents under the rubble, the anguish of the sick, the despair of the dying. Help us to lift up the sorrow of Gaza. That the groaning of the suffering might be carried and held in your wounded hands. Amen. Okay, so we're going to begin. Um, what I'm going to be doing in my section is I'm going to begin with a number of assumptions that we are working out of this evening that we think are just good ground assumptions to begin with. Uh, then I'll be saying a brief uh, history uh, of Palestine and Israel. And uh, then I'll be launching in to kind of uh, an exploration of the biblical story and what kind of wisdom the biblical story has for us in this current uh, context. Um, so the assumptions, I shall just go back to my screen share here. Uh, the assumptions that we are, we think are important assumptions to kind of lay bare at the beginning of this kind of an evening are these. First, that the Jewish people cannot be equated with the state of Israel. So given the history and the now increasing rise of anti-Semitism around the world, it's important to say that this is a conflict between the state of Israel and the Palestinian people. There are Jews all over the world who disagree with the official policies of the Israeli parliament. There are members of oh. the Israeli parliament who disagree with the official decisions of the parliament itself. And there are Jewish people who have been working for peace relentlessly, as well as accompanying Palestinians who need to enter Israel for health care and other reasons. And it's a tra tragedy that a large number of those Israelis were killed on October 7th. When we criticize the state of Israel, we're not criticizing Judaism, which is an ethnicity, a religion, and a culture that deserves respect. Anti-Semitism has no place in Christian hope for peace. Secondly, the Palestinian people cannot be equated with Hamas. Given the enduring presence of and increasing rise of Islamophobia around the world, it's important to distinguish between Hamas and the Palestinian people. The attacks that Hamas carried out on October 7th were brutal, violent, and inexcusable. And there are many Palestinians engaged in peaceful protests against the occupation through marches, arts programming, and other educational initiatives, sometimes with Israelis, the boycott, divest, and sanction movement, now, frustratingly, of course, many of these peace methods, peaceful methods of resistance are considered illegitimate by the state of Israel and have wrongly been equated with anti-Semitism. They are not. They are methods of peaceful protest against an oppressive nation state. All to say Islamophobia has no place in a Christian hope for peace. Thirdly, the ancient state of Israel cannot be equated with the modern state of Israel. This is very important. The ancient state of Israel existed for a brief period of time under the rule of King David and King Solomon. 
It was a state that was small and vulnerable, surrounded by empires and enormous military powers, right? Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, whereas the modern state of Israel is the most powerful military and nuclear power in the region. It engages in power politics with other nations. It's supported by the most powerful military power in the world, the United States. And it is the most weaponized part of the world per capita. Those of us who live next door to the United States might find that hard to believe, but it's true. So Israel is no longer a vulnerable state. It has a brutal, uncompromising policy towards Palestinians and their future. And so terminology is important. Israelite refers to those Jews who lived in Israel in ancient times. Israeli refers to those who are citizens, and some are Jewish, Arab, and Christian in the modern state of Israel. Fourth, there is deep historic trauma on both sides of this conflict. And while trauma doesn't excuse violence, it does explain why it's so difficult for the two sides to hear each other. Palestinians feel abandoned, even though there have been enormous demonstrations around the world in support of Gaza. Jews feel ab abandoned, even though the dominant narrative of powerful world governments in the press has been supportive of Israel. And given the history of violence against Jews and against Palestinians, such feelings of fear and abandonment are not surprising. But it does raise the question of how we speak up for the oppressed in this situation, given such trauma on both sides. Now, having said this, it is important to speak into the situation that is happening now and not be limited to discussing historic wrongs. When the death toll since October 7th looks like this, uh, 1,139 people killed in Israel and at least 27,000 people killed in Gaza, we need to be speaking into the injustice being done against Palestinians. And there was just another graphic I found in the same place. This is what happens in Gaza right now every hour. 42 bombs are dropped, 12 buildings are destroyed, 15 people are killed, six of whom are children, and 35 people are injured. This means we have a responsibility to be speaking into the trauma that is happening now. And fifthly, in this seminar, we are speaking as Christians. We are not Jewish. We are not Palestinian. We cannot speak out of those experiences, although we can bear witness to them and lift them up. Our exploration of the biblical text today will ask the question, how as Christians do we read the Bible in this current context? And although I have read both Jewish and Palestinian biblical scholars in my preparation for this seminar, I would not presume that they would agree with everything that I am saying as a Canadian woman living outside of the conflict, looking in. It's the first point under this point, number five. The second is, this is a seminar and not a lecture, though it might feel like a lecture at points, but <laughs> it's intended to also be a seminar. This means that we view what we're doing here as part of a conversation. We don't have all the answers and look forward to further discussion of this topic, which is why we've left some space at the end. We're trying to find our way. And so we welcome your comments, your questions, your corrections, your, your deeper, your deeper in, insights. Okay, let me give a brief uh, overview of the history of the land that we call modern day Israel, uh, Palestine. It has been under the control of various empires throughout most of its history. Those of you who are uh, familiar with the biblical text um, will remember that in biblical times, there was Egyptian control of the area. Even incidentally, when um, the Hebrew people left uh, Egypt in the Exodus account and were heading up to the land of Canaan, Canaan was still under Egyptian control at that time. So they weren't really leaving <laughs> the control uh, of Egypt. Um, there was Egypt, Syria, Babylon, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans. After biblical times, there was uh, the Byzantine Empire, various Arabs, the Tartars, the Crusaders, the Mongols, the Ottoman Empire, the British, and now Israel. This is an area that has been under imperial control for almost all of its history. And that's because it lies kind of at the crossroads between Africa, Europe, 
Asia and the Arabian Peninsula, and often was seen as a buffer state to prevent some of those other imperial powers from being able to reach, um, uh, reach you know, whoever was powerful at that time. Um, and as a result, the land has been known by various names. Um, Philistia is the oldest, uh, from which incidentally we get Palestine. Um, Canaan, Israel, Judea, Samaria, Galilee, um, and then Palestine from about the second century till 1948. And it has been inhabited throughout this history by people from many ethnic and religious backgrounds and has always been multi-ethnic, multi-religious, and multicultural. Even if you're reading in the biblical story about the time of, of David's uh, rule, his kingdom, he's still engaging with all kinds of other peoples uh, in, in, that, uh, in the place. Christianity was born in Palestine and Jewish, Christian and Muslims have lived to peoples have lived there for centuries together. Now in 1948, the state of Israel was established and there were a number of different motivations behind that establishment. And I'm gonna go through these. I'm, I'm well aware there is so much to say about this history and I'm just touching on some of the high points to orient those of you who do not know the history well. And I know there are some of you who do uh, uh, have asked for this history. And I know there are others of you who already know it well. So please bear with me if you're in that latter, uh, latter case. Um, so various motivations for the establishment of the state of Israel. Um, first, for the West, there's different motivations for different peoples, right? Um, for the West, one big motivation was to appease Western guilt after the Shoah of the Second World War. The Shoah uh, literally means um, calamity um, and is the word that uh, Jews use to refer um, to uh, their the genocide of the Jews in the Second World War. Holocaust is a word that's used to describe um, all of those who died in the Second World War, which also included um, people who were Part of, who were gay, uh, Russian prisoners, the Romani people, and, and others. So Western guilt played a huge role in the establishment of the state of Israel, and it continues to play a huge role in supporting the state of Israel, and we just need to name that. Secondly, ongoing anti-Semitism. Uh, conversations about the establishment of the state of Israel uh, started in the 1800s, uh, and and uh, carried forward into the 1900s, um, particularly in Britain. Uh, Britain wanted to avoid an influx of Jews from Russia. So the idea was, let's send them to Palestine so they won't settle in Britain. Um, so this was a big part of, of uh, the, the reason why there was initial thinking about a, a Zionist and Israel, uh, you know, a modern Israel state. Um, one person, Lord Balfour, was a Christian Zionist who in uh, 1917 uh, thought it would be really helpful um, if uh, Jews were in power in the Middle East because that might be of some use in the war. So the fourth reason was a military foothold for the West in the Middle East. And that has translated now into a military foothold for the United States as well. So all of these are ongoing reasons for support too. And fourth, protection of trade routes. Uh, Britain wanted to protect their, their trade routes uh, in the Middle East. And, and a lot of this um, thought uh, uh, you know, uh, around the establishment of the state of Israel happened at the end of the 1800s, beginning of the 1900s, when the area was still very unstable. Now, for Jews, the establishment of the state of Israel was to um, provide a place of safety in the wake of constant anti-Semitism around the world. So Jewish peoples had through the centuries experienced um, expulsions from various countries, um, persecutions, and the establishment of state of Israel would provide a place of safety. In 1897, somebody called Theodor Herzl established the Zionist movement in Basel, Switzerland. And he saw both Christian and Muslims in Palestine as Arabs that had to be eliminated. 
So the elimination of the Palestinian people was part of Zionism pretty much from the beginning. This is something that he wrote. When we occupy the land, we must expropriate gently the private property on the estates assigned to us. We shall try to spirit the penniless population across the border by procuring employment for it in the transit countries, while denying it any employment in our country. Both the process of expropriation and the removal of the poor must be carried out discreetly and circumspectly. Um, <laughs> that uh, was not managed uh, to be carried out uh, discreetly or circumspectly. Uh, but this, this was at the heart of uh, Jewish Zionism at the start. For Christian Zions, Zionists, uh, the establishment of the state of Israel was a way to hasten the return of the Messiah and the inauguration of the millennial age. And this idea was popularized by John Nelson Darby, uh, who was one of the uh, influential people behind the Schofield Bible that shaped much of North American evangelicalism, right? Um, and they saw the establishment of Israel as hastening the end times when Jesus will return, Muslim sites will be destroyed, two thirds of Jews will be massacred and the rest would convert. That should be a clue that Christian Zionism at its heart is anti-Semitic as well. And this is just a slide that has all those points um, in one place for those of you who find that um, helpful. So these are kind of some of the motivations for the establishment of the state of Israel. How has it developed? And I'm gonna show you a map here uh, that I'm gonna talk about for a couple of uh, minutes. This is known as the Shrinking Palestine Map Series. And it shows how Palestin Palestinians lost the land through the creation of Israel in 1948, and then Israel's later seizure of the land by war and military occupation. So the first image, the one that's uh, largely green, shows the British mandate Palestine before 1948. And you can see all of those white spots are Jewish settlements, and the rest is Palestinian land. The second image shows the United Nations partition plan which carved out 54% of the land for a Jewish state. So you can see how much more of that land is white now. The land around Jerusalem and Bethlehem, shown in yellow in the second image, was designated by the United Nations as a corpus separatum, a separate entity open fully and equally to the three Abrahamic religions of the land and all other peoples as well. And in this plan, the United Nations specified that the new Jewish state be administered for the benefit of all its residents, Jew and Gentile, which is a legal requirement that Israel has ignored. Um, now, today, I think there's like 50 laws that discriminate against non-Jewish citizens, including Christian Arabs and Muslim citizens of Israel. Um, now, this resulted, uh, this uh, movement, um, this establishment of the State of Israel in 1948 resulted in the violent forced removal of 750,000 Palestinians from their homes. And 77% of historic Palestine was occupied by Israel, much of the coastal areas and the economic metropolises. This is called the first Nakba, the first catastrophe. And some Palestinians went to neighboring states some to the West Bank, some to Gaza. There are 31 Palestinian refugee camps in Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria, 19 in the West Bank. And until uh, October 7th, two thirds of the population of Gaza were refugees. Now the entire population pretty much is. There are 5 million Palestinian refugees worldwide. It's the largest refugee population in the world. Now that cycle of violence resulted in resistance on the part of the Palestinians, as well as neighboring countries. And Israel with their superior military power has been able to expand their territory in the face of these attacks. And so the third map shows additional lands captured by Israel during the Arab-Israeli war of 1948 to 49. Um, the land shown in green on this third map were later captured by the Israeli, Israeli forces in the 1967 war, some of them, um, which is called the Six Day War uh, to parallel the six days of creation. So Israel is being created in this war, the six days and the seventh day there will be peace. 
So from 1967 on, Israel has built settlements and roads in the West Bank. It has systematically stolen land from the rightful Palestinian owners to build Jewish-only colonial settlements. And uh, Jewish-only roads connect the settlements throughout the West Bank. And so this fourth map shows what remains today, 70 isolated islands of land. And Palestinians live in these areas, but they must have permission from the Israeli military to enter and leave. And of course, what remains of Gaza before October 7th is a tiny strip of land, which was under economic embargo, uh, imports and exports were limited, and it was severely limited who could enter and leave. There was also, as part of all of this, an erasure of Palestinian history, something that uh, people in North America know happened to Indigenous peoples as well. So Palestinian books were collected and destroyed. Palestinians were renamed Arabs. The Palestinian flag became a terrorist symbol. Palestinian archaeological and historical artifacts were destroyed. And Palestinian history was erased in this Israeli textbooks. Um, and uh, even in the press in the West, uh, you, you will see that often you will not have uh, references to Palestine uh, in the press. So there's this kind of erasure of this whole history. Um, part of this, part of the way that the um, Palestinians are contained is by use of a wall, and I forgot to write in how long this is, but this wall snakes around all of the Palestinian territory in the West, territories in the West Bank. And there's also a wall, the wall that was breached on October 7th around Gaza. You can see, every time you see pictures of the wall, you see this incredibly dense populated area on the Palestinian side, because there are so many people crammed in such to such small places and there is space on the Israeli side. Um, movement through this wall is through checkpoints. There are enormous lines up, uh, lineups always. Children are checked on the way to school in order to go to school or to work or even to their farmland or to harvest their olive groves. Palestinians almost always have to go through these checkpoints. There are also two separate sets of roads, one set of road for Israelis and one for Palestinians. And there are over 47,000 Palestinian political prisoners right now, many on administrative detention, which means they have not been charged, and 500 to 700 Palestinian children are arrested every year. Um, this is a picture from No Way to Cheat, Treat a Child. Um, and uh, this young boy being arrested is uh, 16 years old years old and was part of a peaceful protest. So there's all these ways that Israel has kept a very, very tight control on the Palestinian people while pushing them into smaller and smaller areas. Again, the history of Canada uh, is not that different in some ways to this history in Palestine. So let's move to the biblical text. How has the biblical text been used in this situation? Um, Mitri Rahab, who is a uh, Palestinian pastor and academic, um, and this is a slide I uh, stole from <laughs> one of his presentations a couple of weeks ago, um, says that the Israeli settler colonial project is enabled and maintained by hardware and software. The hardware is the weapons that you see on these Israeli soldiers and on this Bible, the software are the biblical texts that people appeal to, to give divine legitimation to what's happening in Palestine and Israel today. This is one of those texts, and there are a number of them, uh, a number, another one we're going to look at when we look, go through the whole biblical story, but this is an example, um, Genesis 17, 3 to 9. Then Abraham fell on his face, and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abraham, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant 
to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land where you are now an alien, all the land of Canaan, for a perpetual holding, and I will be their God. Israeli officials, Jewish settlers, and Christian Zionists all point to these and similar texts to support their position that this land belongs to Israel. They claim that these verses mean Abraham and his descendants will inherit the land forever. The book of Joshua has also been used as a blueprint for conquest and settlement of the land. And again, a slide from Mitri Rahab, uh, what he calls the Joshua factor. Um, and here are a number of quotes. This is Ezra Yachim, who says, wipe out their families, their mothers and their children. These animals must not be allowed to live any longer. This was in a um, uh, an address to the Is Israeli uh, army. Um, uh, Bezalel Shmotrich says, you are here by mistake because Ben-Gurion didn't finish the job and throw you out in 1948. And then, uh, um, the Israeli agriculture minister, Avi Dichter, says, we are now rolling out the Gaza, Gaza Nakba. The Gaza Nakba 2023, that's how it will end. And all of these ways of talking about wiping out the families, about wiping out the people, that all appeals to Joshua, the book of Joshua, as a blueprint for conquest and settlement. And I'm going to say more about that. And there's also... Uh, a reference to the Amalekites um, from 1 Samuel 15. So in a press conference on October 27th, 2023, Netanyahu referred to the Bible in declaring the invasion of the Israeli troops into Gaza. You must remember what Amalek has done to you, says our holy Bible. Netanyahu is not known to be particularly religious, but he's he's he knows how to weaponize the Bible. 1 Samuel 15, this is what it says about Amalek. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. So in appealing to, in calling the Palestinians Amalekites, in comparing them to the Amalekites, this is the subtext of what Netanyahu, Netanyahu is saying. So here's the thing. If this is how the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible is being used, how do Palestinian Christians read the text? How do you read a text that is appealed to for your destruction? Um, on the one hand, you read it, read it through the lens of Christ, which is something that we all uh, should be doing, I think. Um, but on the other hand, perhaps some of the texts should simply not be read. Some of these texts are not suitable to be read anymore. Um, and perhaps we should be reading this as a text for liberation. That's partly what I'm going to be doing today. In preparing uh, my look at the biblical story, there are um, three books I relied uh, heavily on uh, for today. The first is by uh, Naeem Stefan Atik. It's called The Palestinian Theology of Liberation, The Bible Justice, and the Palestine-Israel Conflict. I'll be sending out an email tomorrow with all of these resources listed in it. So if you can't get them all down, you'll, you'll get it in the email tomorrow. Um, Atik is the founder of Sabil, which is a uh, Christian uh, peace organization that works for peace in, the, in, in, uh, in Palestine. Mitri Rahab, uh, a pastor and um, uh, an academic, uh, his book, Faith in the Face of Empire, The Bible Through Palestinian Eyes. I actually could have, and also, you could probably, I'm very small at the side, aren't I, next to what you're seeing on screen. This is, this is Rahab's book. Um, very, very uh, helpful. Um, and this is uh, uh, Atik's book. I first met Naeem Atik in 1989 when he was visiting um, Oxford, where I was a student. And um, he told us the story of the founding of the state of Israel. He was, he was young, he was 11. Um, and his father came to him and said, there, the Jewish people will be moving into our land and they need us to welcome them because they have been terribly hurt and they have been murdered all over the world. And we will provide a welcome for them. And then the soldiers sh showed up 
and pushed them out of their home and sent them uh, sent them to other villages where they had to that, to try to find somebody to take them in. And you know the whole vision of hospitality that his father had laid out as a devout Christian um, was completely kind of turned turned on its head. He seeks, however, to still um, live into that vision by uh, working um, for peace uh, and justice, uh, justice through nonviolent means in Palestine. And the third book I uh, relied on quite a bit was Walter Brueggemann's book, Chosen. It's a very thin little book, uh, but if uh, you can lay your hands on that, it's a good thing to have. I also have two other books here by Munter Isaac that I will show at the um, end of the session. I um, I have them and have just skimmed them, so I haven't read them as, as well as, as the other three. So what we're going to do now is we're going to walk through the whole biblical story. Now, some of you who've taken my classes before have uh, seen me do this before, but we're going to be reading, walking through the story with different questions. Um, what kind of a story is this in the face of the context in which we find ourselves? Um, is it true that you can find texts that will bolster anything you believe in the Bible, as some say? And I think yes and no. If you just read this Bible as a collection of proof texts, you can find anything you want. But that's not what kind of a book it is. I mean, by that criteria, you can read a murder mystery and conclude that because somebody got killed at the beginning, the author approves of murder, um, which, you know, isn't the case. That's just part of the plot, right? This is a book about a relationship between the creator God and creation, the relationship between the creator God and humanity, and a relationship between the creator God and the people whom God has called to bring healing to the world. And because this is a book about a relationship, there are points at which things happen that are not faithful reflections of who God is or who the people are called to be. And it's also a book written within the confines of an ancient patriarchal and tribal culture. And so it needs to be interpreted in that context. So the question isn't, how do these actions of the story measure up to our modern criteria for acceptable behavior, or can we just import those behaviors into our modern context? But what did this mean in its ancient context? And what are the parallels for our context? So there's the question of what kind of a story is this that we're gonna we're gonna explore, but also the question of what kind of a God do we need in this story? Um, and because the Hebrew Bible is the part of the story that is appealed to most strongly by Christian Zionists um, and Jewish Zionists and the state of Israel, I will spend more time on that part of the book, on the Hebrew Bible, though I will draw threads into the New Testament. So Here's a diagram of the biblical story, and this has some of the high points of the story that we are going to walk through. But this is, I'm, I'm putting this up to show you, and again, I'll attach this to the email tomorrow. I'm putting this up to show you that we are, are talking about a narrative here. We're talking in, about an overarching story that has plot developments and low points and high points and different things happen. And so we're going to treat it as a story and things are gonna unfold in that story. And there are themes and threads that carry through the story. There are themes that are intention in the story and we're gonna see how that all plays out. So let's, I'm gonna walk through it rather quickly, <laughs> um, but some of this for, I think a lot of you will be familiar. The story begins of course in Genesis with not a violent creation, like as in so many surrounding creation myths, but a good creation that is breathed by God on his word, on, on God's word. Um, humanity are the image bearers of God in this creation, not slaves as they are in some other creation narratives, and the ones called to serve and observe the rest of creation. It is a story of delight, the creation story. God says, tov, 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 it is good, it is good, it is good. Um, and by the end of Genesis 1 and 2, we see that God's original plan was to hang out in a garden by a river with a whole bunch of cool animals and bugs and fish and birds and a couple of naked vegetarians. This was the intent of the story. And then very early in the story, we encounter what's called uh, generally the fall, the turn. 
the human beings, the human creatures engaged in an act of radical culinary indiscretion. They ate out of season and curse enters the story. And from this point on, if you had that diagram in front of you, you would see there's creation and fall. And from that point on, God is engaged in bringing healing and restoration back to creation, back for all of creation. Everything else that happens in the story is God working to recreate, to create a world where God can once again hang out in this wonderful, diverse creation with the creatures that God has created. That's why the end of the story is God coming down into the new Jerusalem where there's a river, trees surrounding that river, fruit for everybody in their season. The end of the story is God coming to hang out on earth with us once again. Everything in between is trying to get to that point. So the next major plot twist in the story is the flood. Um, Genesis 6 says that God realized at the beginning that God realized that uh, that the heroes, the warriors that had appeared on the earth were creating violence. And God's heart was filled with grief and with regret. Grief frames the story of the flood. And so what does God do to deal with that violence but wipe everything away? except there's a turn at the end. At the end of the flood narrative, Genesis 8 and 9, God commits to never acting this way again, to acting with restraint, even though human beings still have evil in their heart. God says, I'm not going to do this again. I make a covenant with the people, the land, and all living creatures. And just in case we miss the point, that's repeated seven times, that covenant language in Genesis chapter 9. So how will healing come? Well, this is the next turn in the story. God calls Abraham and says, I'll just read this. Now the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So the way to deal with evil is not violently getting rid of it, but creating a community who can bring blessing in the middle of evil. Instead of wiping out the bad guys that happened in the flood, God is creating a community of restoration and healing in the midst of violence. And this isn't a promise for the sake of Abraham's descendants alone which is how the text is appealed to sometimes. But it is a promise that will bring blessing to the rest of creation. All the families of the earth will be blessed. And in Genesis, all the families of the earth refers to the plants and the animals that were also brought forth from the earth. This isn't that far from Genesis 1 and 2, where it says that all parts of creation were brought forth from the earth, except for the uh, fish of the sea who were brought forth from the waters. Um, so th this community, Abraham's offspring, are called to be a people who shows what it looks like when God is in their midst, when God's healing and restoration comes for all of creation. And this is reinforced by the promises uh, that I showed you earlier from Genesis uh, 17, but also in promises to Jacob and Isaac and, um, sorry, uh, Isaac and Jacob and later to Moses. Um, Interestingly enough, the language of being chosen <laughs> has been used abusively throughout history, right? Turtle Island uh, and Indigenous peoples, the oppression of the Black population by Afrikaners in South Africa. Um, I'll say more about that when we get to the conquest. There's something else that happens in the Abraham narrative. And this is a really interesting part of the story because it's a big part of the story. And I'm talking about Hagar here. And there, here I put Genesis 16, but she also occurs a few chapters later as well. Hagar gets a tremendous amount of text time, so to speak, air time, more than Sarah. Um, so Hagar, for those of you not familiar with the story, is the enslaved Egyptian girl who serves Sarah, Abraham's wife. And when Sarah is unable to conceive a child to fulfill this promise that God just gave to Abraham, Sarah gives Hagar, her enslaved girl servant, to Abraham 
so he might conceive a child with her. And when Hagar conceives, it says she looked with contempt on Sarah. And then the text goes on to say that Sarah treated her harshly. So Hagar ran away to the wilderness where God appeared to her and promised that her child would have many descendants. And after this, Hagar names God, the God who sees, El Roy. She's the only person in the Bible to name God. Later, God appears to Hagar again when she's driven out into the wilderness by Sarah and Abraham. Having this Hagar narrative in the middle of the Abraham story tells us something about the character of God very early on as one who cares for the vulnerable, those who are sexually abused, those who are enslaved without a voice, women who have no power. And Shai Held, who is a Jewish scholar, in his book, The Heart of Torah, also points out that the vocabulary in this story is mirrored in descriptions of the treatment that Israel experienced at the hands of the Egyptians. And he puts it this way, and I'm just going to read the quote because it is so, this is such a great point. The role reversal is stark. An Israelite mistress subjugates her Egyptian slave. And the term used to describe the slave's experience is a word almost always associated with what the Israelites suffer at the hand of Egypt. And by a simple shift in vowels, the Egyptian slave's name, Hagar, becomes Ha-Her, the stranger. Kerut being a stranger, Advut being a slave, and Inu being oppressed are here the fate of an Egyptian exposed to the cruelties of her Israelite mistress. The Torah thus tries to knit two forms of triumphalism and self-congratulation in the bud. Israelites are not only the victims, not the only victims. Just like anyone else, they can all too easily become victimizers. And God may love them uniquely, but God does not love them exclusively. God also loves and sees those whom the Israelites, for whatever reason, do not. And again, that's from Rabbi Shai Held, the heart of Torah. This theme, that God may love Israel uniquely, but does not love them exclusively, is continued in a number of ways as the story continues. I mean, Hagar is given the same promises as Abraham, abundant offering, um, offspring, um, and uh, she is allowed to name God. And then her, that narrative of God coming to the vulnerable continues. We see this in the Exodus, where interestingly, we see this same reversal um, in the middle of a story where Egyptians are acting violently to the Hebrew people. Shifra and Pua, who most scholars think are, are, are Egyptian, are the ones who refuse to throw to kill the baby boys as Pharaoh commands and saves them. Um, Pharaoh's daughter, uh, you know, from the very home of the oppressive ruler, takes Moses and raises him and saves him from death. So literally, just like, um, uh, you know, Israelites, as Shahel pointed out, can be both victims and victimizers, um, the Egyptians can be both oppressors and liberators, both of those things. I just have another picture of Pharaoh's daughter here. Then the Exodus story continues, and I, I'm going to be skipping a lot here. And the people are set free. They end up in the wilderness on their way to the promised land. As they discover who they are and who the, their God is, they are given Torah, which is the Jewish name for the law, the first five books. What is Torah? It is a way to image God to be a people who bring blessing and demonstrate a way of life governed not by mil military might or economic power or exclusion or hatred of the other. It's a way to image God. And what is the God like at the heart of Torah? Deuteronomy 10 tells us, for the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who's not partial and takes no bribe, who executes justice for the orphan and the widow, who loves the strangers, providing them food and clothing. You shall also love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. So what is the character of this God of gods and the Lord of lords, mighty and awesome? The one who does justice for the vulnerable and loves the stranger. This is at the heart of who God is. We've already seen this in the Hagar story. 
And we see such care enshrined in laws where the poor are to be cared for, strangers welcomed, justice done for those who are in debt or who have lost land. So what kind of a community, well, the law answers the question, what kind of a community does God want us to be? And here I put it in the positive uh, spin. It's Torah as a way to image God, to be a people who live as if God is in their midst, practicing care for the vulnerable, welcome for the stranger, economic generosity, and justice for the oppressed. That's what Torah calls us to. Now, the Torah and the law also, especially in Deuteronomy, create a big if. Because that promise that some people say is unconditional in Genesis becomes a condition in Deuteronomy. Israel's life is governed by conditions of faithfulness to each other, to the land, and to God. Again and again in Deuteronomy, if they do not obey, if they are not faithful, they will lose the land. Um, this is certainly a tension that some point out in the story. And it's a tension that becomes even more prominent uh, when we get to the conquest. To those texts that talk about the people coming into the land um, and saying that uh, commands that they shall not, that they shall destroy all the people of the land, the Canaanites and the Gergesites and the Jebusites and the Amorites um, and the Moabites. And I'm always uh, one tempted to add gigabytes into that, but that's a whole different <laughs> thing. Um, the question the context raises is, is, is this God racist and genocidal, right? Um, and especially the book of Joshua, which is appealed to by uh, so often in the state of Israel. Here's the thing. The first person, the first story that we meet in the book of Joshua is the story of Rahab in Joshua 2, a Canaanite sex worker in the city of Jericho where two Israelite spies show up to see her. And when soldiers come looking for these spies, Rahab hides them, sends the soldiers on a wild goose chase, and the pro spies promise to save her and her family when Jericho is conquered. Um, She's the first person in the book of Joshua to confess that the God of the spies is God in heaven above and on earth below. The first one. And her belief and faithfulness are contrasted with the fear that the spies exhibit, who, it should be pointed out, never actually do any spying. All they do is they go to the home of a prostitute and then they leave and go back. That's all they do. The fact that the book of Joshua is framed by the story of Rahab, a story of a Canaanite who becomes important in the lineage of David. The story of Rahab undermines, as a result, the dominant narrative of Joshua, where all those who are foreign are idolaters who, who, need, who need to be destroyed. So you've got this dominant narrative, and then you've got this prominent story at the beginning, just subtly undermining it. And you get the same thing with the story of Ruth which is set in the time of the judges. So the book of Judges, you know, is all about how are they going to conquer this land, right? Um, and here we have a book of generous hospitality, right? Naomi and Elimelech have to leave Bethlehem, which ironically means house of, house of bread, Bethlehem, and they're leaving because of a famine. And they go to Moab, where they are, are obviously welcomed by Moabite families, because their sons are able to marry into those families. And this is a patriarchal culture, remember? Ruth's father would have arranged that marriage <laughs> uh, for her. Um, and then when the menfolk die, uh, Ruth demonstrates chesed, loving faithfulness to Naomi, and accompanies her back to Bethlehem after their husbands die. And so that generous hospitality Boaz shows to her is something that she practiced first, which Boaz acknowledges when he commends her for her chesed, her loving faithfulness in chapter three. So just like the story of Rahab, the story of a Canaanite woman, the story of Ruth, the story of a Moabite woman, undermines the commands to destroy and not to intermarry uh, with these foreigners. But they also show that these women, these foreign women have incredible faithfulness and loving kindness. And there's another story I'm not going to tell. It's an earlier story. Um, 
about a Canaanite woman, Tamar, and Judah in Genesis 38, um, who was shown to be more righteous than Judah. And I'm showing her now because she's going to pop up again uh, later. So the story continues. And the people want a king because they want to be like the other nations. And of course, this is like a, a dagger to the heart of God, right? They're not meant to be like the other nations. And when they ask Samuel, this is all in 1 Samuel 8, it's, it's, it'll be on that chart you get. Uh, we want a king. Samuel says uh, to God, what am I going to tell them? And God says, tell them that a king will, will take their sons for his military apparatus. And they'll, he'll take his daughters to clean, come and clean his palace. And he'll take their crops. And he'll take some of their uh, livestock. But the people still want a king. And here's the thing. In Torah, we have guidelines for what that king should be like. They're found in Deuteronomy 17. So if you're going to become a nation like the others, if you're going to have a ruler like the other nations, if you're going to have a prime minister or a president, he should not be a military leader. The text says he should not collect horses and he should not buy or sell horses, which were like the ballistic missiles of the ancient world, right? He shouldn't be an arms dealer. He shouldn't be somebody who maintains power through military alliances. That's what no foreign wives means. He should not be someone who takes loot in battle or shows his power through wealth. He should be someone who follows Torah, takes it seriously, because power rests in taking seriously who God is and what God has called this community to be. So if Israel wants to be a nation, a nation state like other nations, this is what the leader should look like. It should be a nation state grounded in Torah, where there is welcome for the vulnerable and the stranger and care for the vulnerable. And of course, as the story unfolds, ancient Israel does not become the community that God had called them to be. The prophets make clear that they do not care for the poor, they do not care for the land, and they make alliances with other military powers to their undoing, and they do not practice generosity. So how does God respond? With grief and heartbreak. And Terence Fretheim, uh, another one of my favorite Old Testament Scholars uh, says that the, the Godward side of judgment is always grief. And they end up losing the land and ending up in exile. It's a time of devastation and trauma. And the prophetic books explore this devastation and trauma, especially Jeremiah and the Book of Lamentations. But in those prophetic books, we also see promises of hope, of newness, of restoration, uh, that God will enact this reconciliation because the people are unable to do so. And there are various texts that talk about the restoration of the people in the land. And ironically, a lot of those texts, which talk about caring for the most vulnerable, which talk about justice being established, which talk about peace, are used um, by uh, the state of Israel as texts that show Israel was supposed to come and be restored in the land. And I'm talking here about texts like Isaiah 65, Isaiah 35, Ezekiel 34, Jeremiah 31, and Ezekiel 37. So the texts that talk about peace and justice coming, about God's care for the vulnerable, about restoration, are used to legitimate the expulsion and oppression of Palestinians from the land. This is a tragic perversion of the text. Um, well, some people do return to the land after a while. And this is where you have another interesting twist in the story. As he, in Ezra 9 and 10, and also in the book of Nehemiah, you have uh, these rulers discovering that that people have intermarried with the people of the land, with the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and Jebusites. The Jebusites, are, interestingly enough, are the indigenous people of Jerusalem. Um, the Ammonites, the Moabites, Egyptians, and the Amorites. Um, so what do they do? Ezra and Nehemiah command the people to send the foreign women they have married away with their children. It takes days and days and days, there are so many of them, but they send them away. And this becomes a dominant thread in the tradition <laughs> uh, that uh, 
that having foreigners in the land is a problem, but it is contradicted by other texts like Ezekiel 47, so which says you shall divide the land according to the tribes when you come back from exile. You shall allot it as an inheritance for yourselves and for the aliens who reside among you and have fathered children among you. They shall be to you as the native born of Israel. They shall be allotted an inheritance among the tribes. And wherever the tri alien tribes reside, you shall assign to them their inheritance. So there's this uh, other thread, this challenge that says, no, no, it's not about purging. We are living together in this land. Though here, of course, it is only the, uh, those who have uh, children with um, uh, uh, Israelite uh, women. Um, there are other texts that challenge this as well. There's the book of Jonah, which has its whole story is about how God cares for this other people, the people of Nineveh, right? Um, there's also texts like Isaiah 19. On that day, Israel will be the third party with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth, whom the Lord of hosts has blessed, saying, blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my heritage. Here you see God using terms that are usually used just for Israel, for Egypt, and for Assyria, as if there's a whole other story of a relationship God has with these peoples. Similarly in Amos 9, where it says, did I not bring Israel up from the land of Egypt and the Philistines from Kaphtor and the Arameans from Kerr? There's this kind of like, oh, wait a minute. There's another liberation story for the Philistines. There's another liberation story for the Arameans that isn't recorded here because the books that we have are not their nation's story. They're the stories of the people of Israel. Let me just say a few summary points at this uh, part of the story. So this is a story where the elite narrative of dominant power, because don't forget the people who codified uh, all of these books um, and edited them, uh, who wrote the oral traditions down would have been the elite, right? Court officials. The elite narrative of dominant power is constantly undermined by a counter narrative from below, where the foreigner and women often are the recipients and conveyors of God's compassion and faithfulness, and who often show, well, I say that, the conveyors, they convey God's compassion and faithfulness. Secondly, this is a story where the promises of life in the land are given so that the community can show what it looks like when God lives in their midst for the healing of all of creation. The, the, the promises are for a purpose. Um, covenants have a purpose. That purpose is blessing, which is, which is why, you know, if I'm preaching at a wedding, I like to say you're making a covenant here, and that's not just for the two of you. That's for the blessing of the whole community around you, right? That's what a covenant is for. And thirdly, this is a story where the creator God responds with grief to the violence that is done on the earth and who works relentlessly for newness. Everything that happens in this story is God working for newness and healing. Everything. Now, these narrative points are embodied in Jesus. It's not the case that, you know, in the Hebrew Bible, we have a dark story of a judgmental, violent God, and that Jesus enters into the story, bringing grace and peace. All along, this is a story of a God who offers forgiveness, who works for healing and resurrection, um, and who works for the healing of the whole world. Uh, all along, this is a story that says Israel is loved uniquely, but not exclusively. And that continues in the Gospels. So in Jesus, and I, I'm just quickly going to go through these examples. In Jesus' genealogy in Matthew 1, only four women are singled out. Two Canaanites, Tamar and Rahab were on this slide, um, and uh, uh, Ruth, a Moabite, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. He is a Gentile. Was she perhaps a Gentile as well? We do, we do not know, but I think the possibility is there. Um, so again, we have, you know, Jesus' genealogy lifts up 
these, these marginal stories from below that undermine the rest of the story. Um, Jesus' sermon in Nazareth uses the examples of the raising, well, after the sermon, when he's having a little Bible study with people after, um, uses the examples of the raising of the son of a Gentile widow and the healing of Naaman the Syrian. That, that Gentile widow story is from 1 Kings 17, where Elijah provides food to the Gentile widow and heals her son. And he uses the example of Naaman, the Syrian army commander, to show not only that God's healing is for the foreigner, but also for the enemy. I mean, Naaman was taking Israelite girls to be slaves. So I think we can assume he was an enemy. Um, and so Jesus here is, is lifting up these stories to show God's continuing intent to grant healing to those who are outside of the tradition. And that's carried through in all kinds of ways. And I just, I don't have all of them here. Uh, the Samaritan woman, right? You know, Jews and Samaritans uh, had as an incredibly, uh, incredible animosity, as bad as what's going on in Israel and Palestine now, and um, uh, had engaged in violent acts towards each other, she's the first one to declare Jesus is the Messiah and converts her whole village. Um, Jesus uses the Good Samaritan as an example of what compassion to neighbor looks like. And in Matthew 15, a Canaanite woman, which is already kind of weird, because that would be like saying, you know, because I have uh, you know, way, way back, Icelandic uh, <laughs> blood, that I that would be like me saying I'm a Viking, right? Um, Canaanite wasn't used in the first century. I think Matthew's making a point here about Canaanite people because Jesus says that she has great faith. Only one of two people in Matthew with great faith. The other is a Roman centurion. So I think this is a rehabilitation, actually, of the Canaanite woman tradition. I have a whole Bible study about that, but no time for that here. Um, we just see how these, these threads of those outside the tradition um, are, are welcomed into the story. This is a story for all. And that continues to open out in Acts and through and into the epistles. And Paul makes this in a very pointed way, this point in Romans 12 where he says, contribute to the needs of the saints, extend hospitality to strangers, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. So who are you blessing? Those who persecuting, are persecuting you are your oppressors. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but walk with the oppressed. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And then he continues, no, <laughs> that whole vengeance thing is a no. That's not where we're going. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with, with good. Paul's instructions towards enemies indicate not only is this community to practice a generous hospitality to those within their ranks, but they're also to extend that hospitality to those who are acting unjustly towards them, bless those who persecute you. And in other words, those who are enacting the kinds of economic just injustice that Paul has described throughout his letter, and he, I think he actually is describing throughout Romans economic injustice, um, those are the ones who are to experience the economic generosity of the community. And that is to be extended even to enemies. So Paul is replacing vengeance with a love that is actually economic. Give them food and drink. And in so doing, I think that he's actually echoing another Old Testament story, another Hebrew Bible story. This is the story of 2 Kings, where Elisha is surrounded by his enemies. He strikes them blind. He leads them into the heart of Samaria, where the Samarian king says, can we kill them? Can we kill them? And they, that's why they have their bows drawn. And Elisha is like, no, did you capture them? I want you to feed them. And so the enemies are fed. 
And it says that the Arameans or the Syrians no longer came raiding into Israel. This was kind of an economic solution, uh, sorry, a political solution, feeding <laughs> the enemies. Um, and Paul is echoing that at the end of Romans 12. Um, and I think this is, this is important too, because uh, this isn't just a welcome for those who are outside the tradition who have confessed that God is faithful or who have demonstrated loving faithfulness, who have shown themselves to be good foreigners or good Gentiles. But this is an extending the arms of welcome, even to the enemy. Now, given these... Um, trajectories, I'm going to just stop sharing for a moment here. Um, given these trajectories, it's hard to argue for an exclusive blessing for Israel and the land, even if one just looks at the Hebrew Bible. What is the central, a, a central theme from the Hebrew Bible that's, that's pulled into the New Testament is an emphasis on love of enemy, care for the vulnerable, and justice for the oppressed. To ignore such themes in the text is a fundamental misreading of the story. But there's one other question, I think, that we need to ask. In the midst of suffering, the text repeatedly asks, where is God? The psalmist asks this question. It's at the heart of the prophetic literature, especially Jeremiah and the Book of Lamentations. Where is God when people are suffering? And I hope that this survey has shown you that God is with the suffering Egyptian slave girl in the wilderness. God is with the Hebrew people groaning under Egyptian slavery, with Rahab, the prostitute in Jericho, with Ruth and Naomi, the widows, with David as he runs from Saul in the wilderness, even though I didn't talk about that story. Uh, David doesn't kill Saul when he could have. <laughs> with the widow of Zarephath starving to death with those who are lost and strayed and ill and hungry and wounded, with those taken into exile and those who remained in the rubble of their destroyed city, with the young couple whose baby was born into Roman occupation and with the hungry and the ill, the homeless, who suffered daily under that occupation. Paul in Romans 8 describes it this way, that affliction, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or the sword, none of it can separate us from God's love, right? I think today he would add, you know, bombs and, and uh, starvation. Um, but I think actually Mitri Rahab uh, says this best. And so I'm going to conclude by just sharing uh, this quote with you from, uh, from him. This is from his book, Faith in the Face of Empire. The revelation the people of Palestine received was the ability to spot God where no one else was able to see him. When his people were driven as slaves into Babylon, they witnessed him accompanying them. When his capital, Jerusalem, was destroyed and his temple plundered, they saw him there. When his people were defeated, he was also present. The salient feature of this God was that he didn't run away when his people faced their destiny, but remained with them, showing solidarity and choosing to share their desti destiny. Consequently and ultimately, Jesus revealed this God on the cross. In a situation of terrible agony and pain, when he was brutally crushed by the empire and hung like a rebellious freedom fighter. The people of Palestine could then say with great certainty, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are. For those of you who attend a church that uses the Revised Common Lectionary, this Hebrews verse was part of the epistle reading this morning. So Jesus is the one and God is the one who accompanies the people in radical solidarity throughout the story and even today. Throughout this entire story, God is with the suffering ones. And we have no reason to think that God isn't with the suffering ones now. 
uh, which is why we call the seminar Jesus in the Rubble. Not only because Jesus was laid in the rubble at his birth, but, but because he continues to walk in the rubble throughout his life. And I'm going to stop there, uh, and Paul is going to pick it up now and uh, talk about possibilities for peace. What can we do? And if there are questions, again, that the stuff I've done on the Bible uh, has raised for you or things that weren't clear or things that you thought I should have said and why didn't I, put that all in the chat and we'll address those questions um, in a bit. So, Paul, over to you. Thank you, Sylvia. What a beautiful overarching narrative of welcome, of commitment, forgiveness. Um, I think what I'm talking about really is how do we live into this story? How do we live into this story right now? Since the first reports of the Hamas attack and the daily reports of the death and destruction wreaked by the Israeli response, many of us have struggled to make sense of the situation, to find a way to pray through it. We've been asking, what can I do? Some of us are looking for practical steps. This is a complicated political and theological situation. We know we're being called to do something, but not sure where to start. Some of us are so overwhelmed by the reports and scenes of death and destruction in Gaza that our what can I do is really an admission of inertia from being overwhelmed. Many of us are angry about the silence of the churches and the dancing of our political leaders in the face of such human suffering, but have yet to turn that anger into action, or perhaps we're afraid our anger might turn into hate. I want to try and speak to the question of what can I do? My starting point will be to draw on the wisdom of two icons of the 20th century Catholic peace movement. After that, I want to speak briefly about my own experience of being overwhelmed and unsure. And from there, I want to suggest some practical action steps drawing from our recent experience of grappling with the church and with our politicians. So first, our icons. Jim Forrest dedicated his life to peace work. I had the privilege of his friendship for the last five years of his life. Jim in 1961 was struggling with his faith, thinking about the works of mercy and nonviolence, while at the same time learning to be a weather expert in the US Navy. Jim's reporting unknowingly was part of the strategic work that led to the Bay of Pigs invasion. Upon learning of this, he naively joined a silent process outside the CIA offices in Washington. I say naively because he was actually surprised when he got called up on the carpet by his commanding officer a few days later. He was discharged after filing to be a conscientious objector. His friendship with Dorothy Day and with Thomas Burton influenced him to make peace and nonviolence his life's work. Jim writes this, and I quote, among the things that Jesus did not say in the Sermon on the Mount is, blessed are those who prefer peace, wish for peace, await peace, love peace, or praise peace. He requires an active rather than a passive role. In fact, peace itself is a dynamic state that can be anything but peaceful, for those who wish people would simply be quiet and do what is expected of them by whoever happens to be in charge. Jim goes on to suggest that in addition to dynamic action, we need to do our own inner work, develop purity of heart and humility to enable us as peacemakers to rebuild broken bridges, pull down walls of division, and assist in recovering our lost communion with God and with one another. Thomas Merton, the Trappist monk and spiritual writer, wrote in September 1961, I don't feel I can go on writing about things like meditation. I think I have to face the big issues, the life and death issues. A month later, he published The Root of War is Fear in the Catholic Worker newspaper. 
Merton wrote in that essay that Christ the Christian task, I quote, is to work for the total abolition of war. Otherwise, the world will remain constantly in a state of madness. There is much to be studied, much to be learned. Peace is to be preached. Nonviolence is to be explained as a practical method. Prayer and sacrifice must be used as the most effective weapon in our war against war. And like all weapons, they must be used with deliberate aim. When I pray for peace, I pray to be protected from the folly and blindness of my own country. When I pray for peace, I pray not only that the enemies of my country may cease to want war, but above all, that my own country will cease to do the things that make war inevitable. End of quote. Peacemaking then requires education, prayer, liturgical expression. It's never passive, but always dynamic, requiring our reimagining how things can be. Peacemaking upsets the status quo. Its aim is not the defeat of an enemy, but rather the reconciliation of enemies, the recovery of communion. Love and justice are at its heart. Unlike Jim, I did not come to this understanding in my 20s. I was more like one of those preferring, wishing, or awaiting peace. Jim's spiritual searching collided with his work in the Navy in the Bay of Pigs invasion, provoking him to read the circumstances of his life, something we all need to do, to discern the Spirit's call. I was a grandfather before I was similarly challenged. Our first granddaughter, Morgan Rose, was born in March 2016 during the crisis in Syria. Her father is Ojibwe. So her future included growing up on a First Nations reservation in a country where some 2,000 First Nations women have either been murdered or disappeared in the last 25 years. A country whose government until 30 years ago had been committed to the cultural genocide of its indigenous people. I couldn't admit myself that to myself until I was actually holding her in my arms. I thought about the dangerous complexity of Syria, civil war, ISIS, the involvement of Russia, the USA, Canada, France, Turkey, could anything be more volatile? Her birth, birth forced me to ask, what sort of world will my granddaughter inherit? Violence, racism, climate change, and war made it possible to imagine that there might not even be a world for her to grow up in. Asking one led to a question what led to another. What can one person do? I had no answer, but my discomfort became my motivation. I began to read Thomas Merton's essays, letters, and poetry on nonviolence. I visited with Jim Forrest in Amsterdam in 2017, and we talked for three hours about Merton and about Jim's lifelong witness to peace and nonviolence. I returned to Toronto wondering if I could organize a parish book study on peacemaking. I wondered if I could get Jim Forrest to speak at the Church of the Redeemer. My friend, Karen Pascal, asked questions that shifted me from vague longing to concrete vision, and then facilitated connections with three Christian social justice groups that helped me develop a peace conference that spoke to both mind and heart. Voices for Peace, the name we gave the conference, took place in April 2018. Jim Forrest came and helped us explore the approach and influence of the 20th century, century peacemakers he had worked with. There were workshops exploring resources on contemplative prayer, disarming your heart, and conflict resolution. There was music, poetry, and film. Attendees were encouraged towards a first step to make their voices heard, the signing of a petition against Canada's nuclear involvement, or perhaps joining a local afternoon march at City Hall supporting peace in Israel and Palestine. Everyone signed, some people marched. Signing the petition, was my first action step. Voices for Peace has now hosted six sessions. The most recent one, which took place via Zoom just after the war in Ukraine broke out, was attended by over a thousand people from 37 countries. The number is not a mark of success, but rather an indicator of the deep need and longing people felt to make sense of the war and a willingness to explore what it meant to build a culture of nonviolence, just like our gathering here this evening. 
My conversion followed a similar pattern to Jim's. The discomfort about my granddaughter's future provoked the process of discernment. It led me to educate myself. Merton's writings helped me build a framework for thinking about peacemaking from a Christian theological perspective. I discovered a cloud of witnesses. Dorothy Day, Daniel and Philip Berrigan, Musty, Teknat Han, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, and their varied approaches led me to start asking what I might actually do. In the process, I realized my need for others, for community. I realized that this wasn't about my isolated voice, but rather about learning to use my voice in concert with others. I discovered the work of other peace organizations, Pax Christi, Project Plowshares, Waging Nonviolence, the Beatitude Center, Pace Bene. So let's come back to our original question. What can I do? We've gathered this evening because we need to educate ourselves, to pray, to find a way forward in this crisis of violence that has set the entire world reeling. We're longing for peace in Gaza and Israel. We're longing for a just solution to this long-standing conflict. We're looking for hope. So specific to the violence and humanitarian crisis in Gaza. First, we need to be realistic. Peacemaking can be a thankless vocation. If you advocate for peace, you may be considered, at best, naive, idealistic, a dreamer, at worst, unpatriotic, a communist, a rabble rouser, who can't, as Jim said, be quiet and do what is expected of them. You may not accomplish much. We can't be discouraged. Merton wrote to Jim and said, do not depend on the hope of results. You may have to face the fact that your work will be entirely worthless. As you get used to this idea, you will start more and more to concentrate not on the results, but on the rightness of and the truth of the work itself. The real hope then is not in something we think we can do, but in God who is making something good out of what we cannot see. First step then after being realistic is to actually do something. If you've been a wisher of peace, start by exploring the background to the Israel-Palestine situation. If you already know some of the history, learn more. Finn is going to put a link to a resource list in the chat area. It will allow you to get your social history and political background in a variety of ways, podcasts, videos, movies, books, novels. You can get connected to other peace advocacy groups, community peacemaker teams, Pax Christi, Canadians for Just Peace in the Middle East, Jewish Voices for Peace, Waging Nonviolence, Mennonite Action, FOSNA. They can keep you abreast of other opportunities. And Finn's going to put that up in the chat for us as well. But education and holding the right opinions are never enough. We need to take action. Start small. Start by signing a petition. Right now, an NDP member of parliament is sponsoring a petition asking Canada to hold itself to account on international arms sales. Canada has a legal obligation to ensure the weapons and systems it provides to Israel and to others are not used in war crimes. Finn will put a link to the background document from Project, Project Plowshares in the chat and then a link to the actual parliamentary petition. Now you might ask, fair question, What's one signature going to do? Recently, an official parliamentary petition urging a ceasefire garnered 286,700 individual signatures. It was part of what moved Canada out of its lockstep with the USA on foreign policy to vote at the UN for a ceasefire. If you can take a first step, the second step becomes easier. There are boycotts or hunger strikes, for example, and Finn's going to put that up for us too. Finn's working harder now than what she was early in the evening. Yeah. Write a letter to your MP and the Prime Minister expressing the need for a permanent ceasefire and a just solution to the crisis in Israel and Palestine. They need to hear from you. You may want to include with your letter the proposals for peace from Marwan Muncher, a former Jordanian diplomat, and Father Naim Stefan Atik, the book whose book Sylvia referred to earlier, 
a Palestinian Christian theologian. And again, Penn's going to put where to where to find these uh, links to these peace plans and assessments in the chat. So far, I've sent three letters to my MP and the Prime Minister, and copied over eighty other members of Parliament. Oops, and all my papers are falling down. Not one has responded. Not one has responded, apart from the standard thank you bounce back. But we need to keep the pressure up. Write a letter to your church leaders. Ask them to actively support a ceasefire. Ask that they provide resources for lament and prayer. If your congregation is not publicly praying for a ceasefire and for the victims of this violence, ask your pastor or priest to do so. Ask them to preach on peace. And um, Finn is going to put in the chat a couple of prayer resources, um, a wonderful series of prayers written by Sylvia on uh, using Bruce Coburn's um, Lovers in a Dangerous Time as a, as a framework. And our good friend, Rose Berger, poet and writer from the States, who did a series of prayers for Israel and Palestine as well. Use them yourself. Give them to your pastor and say, let's use these next Sunday. Build grassroots community. If you're feeling discomfort or anger about this war, rest assured others are too. Find a friend who shares your concerns. Sign petitions together. Write letters together. Pray together. Each of you... Find another friend. Build this one by one. At Redeemer, we have no official peace committee. But since October 17th, we've been able to encourage 12 to 15 people to speak up. We have written to our priest. We've written to the College of Bishops. We've written to the primate. We've persuaded our adult Christian education group to organize a peace study for Lent. Writing to the bishops, by the way, was not a whole lot better than writing to the politicians. The bishops at least answered, but it was more like a pat on the head. Create a visible witness. It doesn't have to be big. Wear a white poppy all year around. Offer them to friends in your church. Sometimes people will ask why you're wearing it. It's an opportunity. Check the chat to order some. Join a peace demonstration. CPJME lists each week the demonstrations that are taking place. Right across Canada, you can find one. Be disobedient. In spite of opposition from the church hierarchy, we began a 20 minute silent peace vigil on Wednesdays each week, two to eight of us, two to eight of us stand outside the Church of the Redeemer at Avenue Road in Bloor, in front of the Christ sculpture, praying silently for 20 minutes, holding signs that say, please join us to pray for peace and silence. Inevitably, a passerby or two stopped for a few minutes. We commandeered, without permission, the announcement time to offer prayer resources, white poppies, and advertise this seminar. Parishioners thanked us for doing so. Follow the examples of Mennonite action. 135 Mennonites held a song protest in Washington and were arrested for their witness for peace in Palestine. And I think in some ways, most importantly, Ground your action in prayer. Thomas Merton has a wonderfully poetic passage in Day of a Stranger, where he lights a candle at 2.15 in the morning in front of an icon and begins to pray Psalm 51. He writes, There is now in the large darkness a small room of radiance with psalms in it. That flickering candle and his psalm prayers centered on mercy become resistant to the idols of war and commerce, the fissionable material and the gold resting on the altar of nearby Fort Knox. Prayer, whether contemplative or intercessory, is nonviolent resistance to evil. And also very important, this can exhaust you. So find ways to nourish your soul and your imagination. Artists, poets, and songwriters can help taking us beyond planning and action. Since October 7th, I found myself diving back into the music of the civil rights era and the music of the black church. There was lament, persistence, and resistance in the lyrics, but also a sense of the immediacy of God's presence. Rhiannon Gibbons' album, Freedom Highway, her song Birmingham Sunday, 
turns the tragic bombing of Birmingham's Baptist Church into an anthem of nonviolent resistance. Liz Wright's album, Grace, Sweet Honey and the Rock, their live version of the Beatitudes and Peace. Closer to home, indigenous artists Digging Roots songs, Cut My Hair and AK-47 are soul-stirring songs that turn the symbols of genocide and violence on their heads and call us into a community of love. John Brooks' song, Son of Hamas, explores a suicide bombing in Palestine and dares to ask if under the noise of bombs and political rhetoric, can we still hear the whisper of love? John is always willing to look into the darkness and find what he calls hard hope. Bruce Coburn is always willing to call out the worst in humanity and our political and economic system, yet encourages our longing to be more than that. It doesn't necessarily have to be music of resistance. Perhaps a Mozart string quartet, a Schubert impromptu will fill your cup, or the deeply contemplative music of Avril Park. Either way, listen with intention. Let the music be your prayer. The works of poets like Thomas Merton, Denise Levertov, and Wendell Berry are provocative, each in different ways is an advocate for peace. Padre Gautumas, Sorry for Your Troubles, are poems exploring his experience with the Coromelia community and the work of reconciliation with Catholics and Protestants. Julia Esquivel writes out of her experience of the violence of the Guatemalan Civil War. Massacres, apocalyptic visions, and scripture give way to a vision of hope. Mary Oliver and Wendell Berry will keep you grounded in the everyday beauty and joy that exists from under our noses. Read the poets of Palestine, Kamir Nasser, Mahmoud Darwish, and more. Let poetry inform your prayer and your way of being in the world. At the end of the day, peacemaking demands actual loving engagement in our broken world. It is not what you think, but rather what you do, springing from a deep sense of compassion love and justice. That's what's going to make the difference. I want to leave you with the words of Denise Levertov, who probably says in a couple sentences what it took me 15 minutes to say. This is from her poem, Making Peace. A voice from the dark called out, the poets must give us imagination of peace to oust the intense familiar imagination of disaster. Peace, not only the absence of war, but peace, like the poem, is not there ahead of itself, can't be imagined before it is made, can't be known except in the words of its making, grammar of justice, syntax of mutual aid, a feeling towards it, dimly sensing a rhythm is all we have until we begin to utter its metaphors, learning them as we speak. A line of peace might appear if we restructured the sentence of our lives, our lives are making, revoked its affirmation of profit and power, questioned our needs, allowed long pauses. A cadence of peace might balance its weight on that different fulcrum. Peace, a presence, an energy field more intense than war might pulse and stanza by stanza into the world. Each act of living, one of its words, each word, a vibration of light, facets of the forming crystal. Thank you. Ah, thank you, Paul. I love that you ended with... Uh... Poetry and song, which is <laughs> something something to nourish us. Um, we have a few, uh, just a few questions in in the chat and in the Q and A, and uh, I'm just going to go through them for a moment. And I think we'll be easily um, ending by uh, by nine o'clock. So the first question, and I've just posted it in the chat for everybody. Would Isaiah five be an example of a text? that can be used in a liberation way for the Palestinians. Sinead O'Connor does this in her song, If You Had a Vineyard, where she sees Jerusalem as the Israelis and the people of Judah as Palestinians. Do you need to be careful to emphasize that we're challenging the state of Israel rather than the Jewish people? 
I say this recognizing that I've heard so many Jewish voices recently speaking out against what the state of Israel is doing, as you mentioned at the beginning of your seminar. I'll, I'll take that backwards. Yeah, I think we do need to be really careful that what we're emphasizing here, it's very easy for um, a, uh, it's very easy to slide into to actual anti-Semitism, <laughs> not, <laughs> not the, uh, you know, if you protest you're anti-Semitic, but, but we are still grappling with anti-Semitism in our world. And so we need to make that distinction. A lot of Jewish people are working for peace um, Isaiah 5, of course, is that classic passage where God talks about uh, having planted this vineyard and, you know, built a tower in the vineyard and put a hedge around the vineyard, and then it yielded wild gates, wild grapes. And God says at the end of Isaiah 5, oh, what more can I have done for my vineyard? Uh, I, looked, I looked for justice, but behold, uh, bloodshed, for righteousness, but behold, the cry. And... Um, yeah, I think it's I think it's perfectly legitimate to read that in terms of um, what's uh, happening uh, between Palestinians and Israel. That that question of it's a question of dynamic analogy and how we read the text, right? So, look, we're reading a text, and um, we have an ancient text in which there was a vulnerable people who were experiencing oppression, and we have a present context in which there's a vulnerable people experiencing oppression. They might not be the same people <laughs> as they were then, but, you know, what is the text telling us about how uh, justice and peace should play out in relation to vulnerable peoples, no matter who, uh, no matter who those peoples are. Um, there's an Old Testament scholar, Norman uh, Gottwald, who, um, in his work on the Hebrew Bible, when he talks about the conquest, he actually argues that the people of Israel were a very vulnerable people coming in to uh, Canaan, which was, as I mentioned earlier, dominated by Egypt and other people who were also poor and in debt and dominated by Egypt gravitated towards that band of refugees and they established themselves in the hill country um, and set themselves up as this alternative village-based economy and society that challenged the empire that they found themselves in. And he says, who's the parallel of those ancient Israelites today? It's the Palestinians, right? They're the ones who find themselves, um, you know, uh, on the marginal land, engaged in subsistence agriculture um, in the face of an imperial dominant power. So I think those are legitimate parallels uh, to make. Um, another question is, uh, what is the origin of the American fundamentalist support for Israel? I know that it is to further the second coming, but who were the preachers that originally promoted this idea? The first was John Nelson Darby, and that's spelled D-A-R-B-Y. And um, and his theology was present throughout the Schofield Bible, which became the um, really the the dominant Bible in evangelicalism at the time. Um, I'm wondering, Brian, um, if if you could uh, if you could say something more about John Darby and the Schofield Bible. Uh, yeah, I could say something about it. I mean, the, the, the Darbyite revivals uh, that happened in, in the United Kingdom uh, and specifically in Wales uh, resulted in uh, a, a theology of, of, uh, of escapism and a theology that, that had a whole new understanding of, of where Israel uh, plays it out. And, and the Schofield Bible um unpacked all of this in the notes in fact my first official king james bible was a schofield bible that my grandmother gave to me and i remember as a young christian writing heresy beside some of the notes really no this this wasn't right and it was most mostly to do with with uh with with israel uh in terms of of how th this just became the dominant uh, understanding of of evangelical uh, American evangelicalism, so Dwight Moody, Billy Graham, Jerry Falwell, you know, all these folks uh, preached this kind of Zionism. 
And also in the 1970s, uh, you know, just three years after the Six Day War, uh, Hal Lindsey published The Late Great Planet Earth, which gave an enormous boost to Christian Zionism. So that was also very influential. So I hope that that, that kind of answers uh, that question. Um, uh, a comment from Stephen Fields, who says that uh, in response to many of our members, Stephen Fields is a priest, uh, who are struggling with the word Israel in our liturgical texts, we at St. James Cathedral are working on a short pastoral document that seeks to describe the differences to which you referred. Israel is distinct from the modern state of Israel. Israelites is distinct from Israelis, etc. What a great idea. It would be wonderful if more churches would do that because there are these, you know, people in the pews have these, these kinds of questions. I sometimes address some of them in sermons, but, you know, not everybody can. Sometimes you will, you're preaching about something different. So I think that kind of a statement, even in a liner note next to the readings, is extremely, extremely helpful. Um, Abita asks, how do you deal with allegations of anti-Semitism just because we recognize the suffering of the Palestinians? Yeah, I mean, that's... Uh, that's a hard one because um, Israel has worked very hard to get the definition of anti-Semitism accepted around the world. That includes anybody who engages in boycott, divestment and sanctions or any criticism of um, the state of Israel. So I think there's a number of things you can do. One is to say, look, these are the Jews I know who are making these same criticisms, who are also engaged in peace, who are also calling for a ceasefire. Um, that's that's one thing. And and also to just make that distinction, I am, I am criticizing a nation state and their political policies. I mean, there are people in the Israeli parliament who, who disagree with a lot of, you know, official Israelite, Israeli, <laughs> I made the mistake, Israeli policy. Um, there are people in the parliament of Israel who disagree with the settlements going in, um, you know, that's a political argument. Uh, that's that's not a racist um, argument. Um, I see your hand, Kay, and I'll get you in just a minute, okay? Um, uh, Lorena, Lorena says, no justice, no peace. A two-state solution is needed. How can we help if their prime minister says no, Lorena? Um, Paul mentioned a couple of different proposals there have been for a two-state solution, both from Jordan and from Naeem Atik. And I think we have no sway over uh, Netanyahu. We do have sway over our own politicians to some degree, right? And so, um, you know, forwarding those proposals for a two-state solution, urging, urging our politicians, uh, all of that are just steps to take, and enough people take those steps, uh, maybe that uh, that would help. For those of you who are wondering earlier, Brian Walsh is my husband. That's why I asked him to weigh in on that question, because I happen to know what he's good at. Um, okay, Kay, uh, if you would like to unmute and ask your question. Okay, thank you. Well, I actually, I didn't have a question. I just wanted to add something to what you was in addressing that accusations of, of being anti-Semitic, because uh, I had an experience early on after October 7th with somebody who I'm very close with, who, because I didn't, um, you know, um, I guess condemn what Hamas did in words that she thought I should, or in in a way that she thought I should, at some point she can she accused me of being anti-Semitic, and I was really hurt about it, and I thought it, and so on. But what I finally came to was this: I will not let anybody stick that label on me when I know I am not anti-Semitic, and so when I know that what I'm saying is a critique of the government, I will point that out and say, and remind people that I am not anti-Semitic. You can't say that to me. I will not accept it. So I just, you know, I think we have to have the strength to say that kind of thing, you know, that, you know, who we are and who we're not. Oh, thanks, Kay. That's that's helpful. And um, Melita and Byron Rempel burkholder have also posted um, a helpful a uh, comment that I've sent to everybody that Jewish Voices has some good resources on a definition of anti-Semitism 
put forth by the Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, because that, that definition has been weaponized, right? Um, and, and he experienced that and others of us have as well. So, um, so I put that into the chat, sorry, independent Jewish voices. Oh yeah, somehow I missed that when I copied it. Should have been independent Jewish voices. So uh, I'll just add that. I'll put these, um, I'm gonna copy the chat and you will get tomorrow uh, everything, all the links that Paul mentioned and everything else in the chat that'll also come out in the email that has also a link for the seminar uh, so that you can you can um, share it or watch it again or whatever. The seminar will be posted uh, on our main website. It won't be a dedicated link like the courses usually are. So it'll be public, you could share it. Um, Nico. Sylvia, if I might just, oh, just say, go ahead, Sylvia, follow. if I could just, just add one thing in uh, with what Kay said about the, the accusation, that sometimes it might be helpful to shift the ground of the discussion and not talk about oppressor and oppressed or whose tragedy is worse or who did that nastier things. But the question could be, do you want peace in the Middle East? And what's, because what I'm in favor of is, is peace. And what steps do we have to take to get there? And just shift that from, because both parties have to take some steps for, for peace to be made. Thanks, Paul. Thanks. I'm so used to being my own, uh, my only person on, on the call, <laughs> on the class. Nico, uh, you can unmute now. Hey, Diz. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. it, a more a poor a paradigm aware it a more low day Oh, if are you did you ask where Hamas is located? Yeah. Okay, so Hamas is the, is an organization um within Palestine of though of people who are violently resisting. Um, the state of Israel. So they are they are found in various places all over and have become stronger in the last number of years. Oh yeah, that's that's it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. We die never know where eh, eh. Yeah. In fact, nobody knows where Hamas is. That's the problem. <laughs> They're trying to find. Oh hey, yeah. Okay. Um, Mary. Go ahead. Yes, I would like to ask whether it's okay uh, to pass the video around to um, the, the recording. Can we share that? Yes, this is a link you can share. That's, Thanks. that's no problem. Thank you very much. Okay, I don't think there are any other questions um, or comments. I have uh, I have a short poem to finish with, uh, and then Paul will close with prayer. So I'll uh, I will share my screen so you can see it. Um, this is um, this is part uh, the end of an editorial by. Um, uh, Angel, um, oh, I, I lost my na name of her. <laughs> it's from the magazine Jewish Currents, uh, the editor from Jewish Currents. And she, she says, we need to imagine a movement for liberation better even than the Exodus. An Exodus where neither people has to, neither people has to leave, where people stay to pick up the pieces, rearranging themselves, not just as Jews or Palestinians, but as anti-fascists and workers and artists. I want what Puerto Rican Jewish poet and activist Aurora Levines Morales describes in her poem, Red Sea. And this is the poem. We cannot cross until we carry each other. All of us refugees, all of us prophets. No more taking turns on history's wheel, trying to collect old debts no one can pay. The sea will not open that way. This time, that country is what we promise each other, our rage pressed cheek to cheek until tears flood the space between, until there are no enemies left. Because this time, 
no one will be left to drown and all of us must be chosen. This time, it's all of us or none. Okay, Paul, if you'd like to, to close. Thank you everyone for being with us here this evening and for sharing in the discussion and listening with such attentiveness. Let us pray. Whoever you are, wherever you live, be blessed. Blessed by a power greater than all of us. Blessed by a wisdom deeper than any of us can claim. Blessed by the presence of a love that transforms our lives. May all of you be blessed with the peace we help one another create. Amen. Amen. And I posted in the chat a vigil for peace and justice uh, in the cathedral that uh, in Toronto that's coming up um, for those who are interested on March 17th. Well, thank you, Paul, and thank you all for coming, and uh, thank you for participating uh, with questions and comments. Uh, I hope this was helpful, and feel free to send an email to follow up if you have other questions or comments or, um, you know, wisdom uh, to share or recommendations. Um, I will also put in the email um, references to two books by Munther Isaac, The Other Side of the Wall, a Palestinian Christian narrative of lament and hope, and Christ at the Checkpoint, Blessed are the Peacemakers, edited by Munter Isaac and Manfred Kohl. And um, so those will be in the e mentioned in the email as well too. Munter Isaac uh, is the person who created the crash of Jesus in the rubble uh, that uh, many of us saw this Christmas. Okay, thank you and have a good night.